Welcome to the New Testament Bible Study, presented by the Gatlinburg Church of Christ. I'm David Barton. The Apostle Paul, writing to the young man Timothy, encouraged him to rightly divide the word of truth. Paul's encouragement both then and even now is to know and study God's word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, is profitable for reproof, is profitable for correction, is profitable for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished, equipped for every good work. Our goal for this study is to focus on and better understand the New Testament epistles written by Paul and, and John and Peter and others. Open your Bibles now and let's study together. But first, let's pause for a word of prayer. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father and our God in heaven, we're thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to be together once again in study of your word. And Father, it's our desire that there would be no divisions among us, that we would all speak the same thing, that we would be joined perfectly together as your word indicates. We pray, Father, you'll continue to be with us and bless us as we open the writings of the Apostle Paul now and the book of 1 Corinthians. Bless us as we study, and may we learn and understand the mistakes that they made, and may, Father, we avoid those same mistakes. Bless us to that end. Use us always in your service. In Jesus' name, Welcome to the New Testament Bible Study. Today, as we begin our 15-minute journey through 1 Corinthians, we'll start in that first chapter. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's read verses 8 through 11. Who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I, pre I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Notice in verse... Eight, the, the promise and the blessings that belong to those who remain faithful to the end of time. Paul writes in that eighth, eighth verse, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only is salvation found in Jesus Christ, but he will confirm and establish you to the end, Paul says. And I love the statement that Paul makes next, that you may be blameless. The original Greek word that Paul chooses for, for blameless does not mean perfect. It means without charge, without fault. For you see, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But in Jesus Christ, we can be blameless on judgment day. We can be without charge. We can be without fault. Turn with me to Colossians uh, the first chapter, and let's read verses 19 through 23. Colossians 1, beginning at verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, notice, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue <clears throat> in the faith grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. Notice Paul's reassurance in that ninth verse of our lesson text. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God is faithful. 
He's sure. He's true. He's certain. He will honor and keep all of his promises. The word that Paul uses for faithful means trustworthy, absolutely worthy of our trust. For see, he's the God who cannot lie, according to Titus 1 and verse 2. He is faithful to keep his promise, that promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior. Paul begins in verse 10 by pleading with the brethren. He says, I plead, I beg you, brethren, that you all speak the same things, that you be perfectly joined together. His first admonition is that they all speak the same things, the same teachings, the same doctrine, the same plan of salvation. That 10th verse reads, Now I plead you, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, notice that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. <clears throat> God's people both then and today are to all speak the same thing as Paul pleads with the Corinthians. The Bible calls for unity, not division. There, that there be no divisions among you is what Paul writes. And the Greek word that Paul uses for division means schisms or splits or separation. It means to be divided into different groups, different factions. Unfortunately, much like the denomination of denominational churches of today, Paul, Paul's recommendation is the very opposite of division. Paul is saying to eliminate the division, to restore that original pattern set by God. He says to be of the same mind and the same judgment. Turn with me to Ephesians, the first, fourth chapter. I want to read those first six verses, and I want you to notice the oneness that Paul presents. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Notice, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice verse 4 and following. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. At verse 11, Paul introduces the source of his information concerning the contentions that were found in that Corinthian church. He writes, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, it is generally thought that someone from Chloe's household had discussed some of the problems in Corinth with the Apostle Paul. And for the second time in just two verses, Paul calls them brethren. First in verse 10, and now here again in verse 11, it is my brethren. Remember, Paul had spent some 18 months in Corinth. He was very familiar with the church there. And this is an expression of love and deep concern for their well-being. He says that there are contentions among you. And the word cont contentions implies that they were divided. The implication from this word is that once they divided, once they split into different factions, then they contended with one another. For see, each faction defended and supported the various positions, the various teachings that they had adopted and had taken. And Paul is clarifying his understanding of what is being said in Corinth. Now, he will identify four factions that divided the Corinthian church. Each faction was based on an allegiance to an individual teacher to an individual preacher, or even to Jesus himself. Now, this is much like the denominational church today, unfortunately. Paul's plea then, Paul's plea today is no divisions. 
no denominations. Remember Jesus' words recorded in Matthew chapter 16 concerning his church. I'll be reading at verse, begin the reading in Matthew 16 at verse 13. When Jesus came to, into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And so they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But who do you say that I am? And it's Simon Peter who speaks up. And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Notice verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So friend, are you looking for the church that belongs to Christ, the one that he promised to build, the one that he came and lived and died for on Calvary's cross? You remember the last verse of Acts chapter 2? Verse 47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Jesus is very clear in his teachings on how to be saved. You remember his words in Mark chapter 16? And Jesus said unto them, he's speaking to the apostles, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That leaves no one out. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Those are the words of Jesus himself. Those will be added to the church. That was true then and it's still true today. And those who do not believe, both then and now, will be condemned, will be lost eternally. Peter writes in his first epistle, the outcome of your faith is the salvation of your soul. That's 1 Peter 1 and verse 9. Remember what the Hebrew writer in chapter 13 says at that 8th verse. Listen to these words. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has not changed. And that applies to Jesus' teachings as well, including the plan of salvation. For you see, it has not changed through the years. Man cannot, man cannot change Jesus' teachings. And so the plan of salvation is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The gospel is still the power of God that leads to salvation for everyone who believes and obeys. So friend, Jesus' instructions back in Mark chapter 16 have not changed, nor will they change. Jesus said then, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now friend, if you have questions about your salvation, please give us a call at the Gatlinburg Church of Christ. We would love to open the Bible and study with you and to discuss any questions or concerns that you might have. God's Word and the Gospel is the power of God that leads to salvation. Thank you for studying with us today. May God bless. Thank you for watching the New Testament Bible Study. If you have comments or questions about today's study, write to us at the Gatlinburg Church of Christ, P.O. Box 361, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, 37738. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, send an email to biblestudy at gatlinburgchurchofchrist.com.